I'm Arini Mahadeva. I am a finance and accounting professional with about 12 years of career experience, currently working with Homes England. I have four years of experience at Homes England, and prior to that, I was back in Sydney doing public private partnerships with New South Wales Treasury. And before that, I actually started with a five year foundation of financial audit, so fun stuff um, there. Day to day, actually, things tend to change around in my current role. So we providing loan finance to developers, property developers, looking to accelerate housing delivery in England. And um, one of the major things that we look to do is work in collaboration with partners to bring forward projects that won't otherwise get off the ground and that's quite rewarding in, in, in a lot of ways and, and uses different skill sets whether it's um, uh, vocal collaboration, interpersonal skills like that or commercial skills when you're analysing cash flows and analysing costing data um, and uh, project details like that or um, it can also vary into legal documents and reading through those and negotiating commercial principles. So it, it's a varied role and um, I think that's what makes it interesting. But it also means that you see the houses coming out of the ground and it's rewarding when you have such tangible outputs and results from the work that you do day in day out. So key skills that you need is good communication skills, really good analytical problem solving skills, the analytical problem solving skills that you get to apply to a scenario enables you to find solutions. It, it might include working with cash flows, but then, then we've also in our team got surveyors with different skill sets that complement the accounting and finance professionals that we have in the team. So it's, it's working with a team, it's working with consultants, so it's often multidisciplinary multifaceted teams that you're working with but also negotiation skills and then you also need to sell it so whether that be uh, presenting to your internal credit committee and saying we should support this loan or negotiating with the developer my personal trait is to work and look for win-wins in, in, in the way I collaborate with developers and I think that's the advantage of working with a government agency is the fact that you do not need to be competitive, you're not looking at the bottom line, you're looking for taxpayers' value for money and um, policy objectives like getting more houses built for the people. So it's really rewarding and it has a, a variety of skills that you can apply in a single day. In terms of a career path and what you need to do to get to a role like mine. I think one of the key fundamentals is in my own journey where, where it started in Sydney, Australia, was that I actually went into a cadetship program similar to an apprenticeship program here in England, but the audit office of New South Wales where I worked actually supported me in getting my degree in parallel, so I worked full-time and studied part-time, and that is definitely challenging. It's very weird going from high school to say, you know, Sir, Miss, to actually being on first name basis to people who are normally like equivalent to your teachers and it's it's really different shift and one of the other things that, um, you know, I think it might be daunting, I might come out as very articulate, but there was a stage in that first year where I wrote down everything and that meant like, Hi, my name is Arini. I want to talk to you about inventory. I had no clue what inventory was when I started my job. And so, you know, there is a place where you start and it can be right from the get-go where you just kind of chip away at things and it slowly builds your com confidence in that way. And I would say the thing that you need to push for is pushing against your comfort against your comfort zone. So don't sit back and say, oh, I'm good at this, so I'm gonna stay here. Um, I would push forward and, and, and aim for something else, um, improving on things that are interesting. Um, I went through different industry sectors, so I, I did energy and then I did water and then rail, road, health, and housing. 
and each time I felt like an imposter. And you will find that that will repeatedly happen, including today, you know. I would also kind of alert you that your career is probably gonna be 40, 50 years. And so, you know, you don't need to get it right now. You, you, there, there is opportunities for continuous learning. I started in audit. I went to kind of commercial state-owned corporation businesses, that kind of policy area. Went to public private partnerships. Realized that I really liked infrastructure and making things happen, seeing the tangible results. And that's how I got into Homes England and housing as well. So, you know, you will find your passion. You will stumble upon it if you keep looking. So I would encourage you just to keep learning and enjoy what you do. In terms of university or apprenticeship, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you need to work to see what works for you. There are some careers where you just, you do need to go through that undergraduate process to, to be able to have the fundamental skills to, to move into it, whether that be engineering or medicine. But if you're looking at accounting finance, there are opportunities where it might be an apprenticeship, it might be an internship. You know, there are opportunities where you can test where your interest lies. What I can say in terms of advocating for apprenticeships though, is that you get to see the day in, day out. You get to interact with people and really find how you fit into that kind of role. It's also an opportunity to find mentors and role models um, in all the jobs that I've found and had. I've looked and adopted. They might not know that they're, they've been mentors and role models, but you kind of adopt um, uh, practices. So take opportunities where you can just shadow. If, if someone, if a director's going to a meeting, um, ask to tag along, ask to be described, just fly on the wall. It, it gives you so much insight into the type of work that you'll be doing and the, the outputs and the strategic overview of the kind of the meaningful task that you might be doing, the big picture perspective. In terms of um, salary expectation, what I would advise you to do is look at the role, look at the criteria, see if it applies to you and it's not only, not at 100%, even if it's a 60% because that's a work in progress. Often what you find is each role will come with a range. So the bottom of the range means that you don't have all the skills, but you could be built, you've got the potential. Don't be intimidated by applying for a role where you might only have 60% of the qualifications. I would say go for gold and, and just do your research. If you apply for something that you are confident you can fulfill with your eyes closed, I would also just question if you're challenging yourself enough, but if you are passionate about it and you're not bound by that, I would look to negotiate and highlight your strengths and say, I need that top of that range um, in salary because I've got all those skill sets. There isn't a work in progress aspect of my CV. The key thing that I want to emphasize is that it's not an upward path, it's more of a spider web. There are gonna be phases in your life where you might just wanna pause and be happy with a nine to five job. There will be other phases in your life where you will want to get ahead rapidly. And I would say put the hard work in network and you'll be able to find opportunities just as long as you're looking. But then there will be opportunities that pop up unexpectedly as well. And I would say, you know, it might not be the best life choice for you at that time. So you would need to actually make sure that it's a work-life balance decision as well. I've got a 22-month-old daughter at the moment, so the types of decisions I make as me now in my early 30s compared to what I would have made at 25 or 18, I just started the workforce at 17, is, is dramatically different. And my aspirations in my own career progression is that I will progress quite rapidly. I feel actually that having a daughter and, and having to be productive on my use of time to allow me to actually have quality time with her means that actually I feel like I could manage my times and my objectives um, a lot more 
smoothly now, which gives me the confidence that I can actually push for a promotion in the near future. And that confidence and maturity will come when you are constantly checking in with yourself as to where you're pushing in, what your objectives are, and where your aspirations lie and where your ambitions lie. And what your ambition was when you were 18 or 27 may not be the same as what they are right now. So they will continuously change. And, you know, I can't reiterate enough that you've got a very long career and if you start off as an engineer, it doesn't mean you have to finish your career as an engineer. If you start off as an accountant, you might be, become a, a, someone who's more in the commercial and finance space as, as my journey has taken me in the last you know, 12 years. But it might also be quite different in terms of, you know, you could go back to university. Um, there are so many opportunities out there in terms of part-time learning, later life learning, um, masters, if you've done a postgraduate, uh, sorry, an undergraduate degree, then there's a postgraduate degree that you can do. There are so many avenues of learning that um, are available. Um, and as people move into a more global market, I would say, you know, don't be limited and don't think that just because you, you're doing something or deciding to do something, that you have to do it for 40 years, it can be for just the next decade. What you will find is a lot of those skills are transferable. When you found your passion, try and try and find places that might be able to test that out, um, test where you actually want to go with something. So, um, you know, if it's mechanical engineering, go in and find your local mechanic and, and, and talk to them or um, go get a tour of the Rolls Royce facility at, at, you know, in Sheffield. You know, if, if you want to do veterinary studies or something like that, you know, you can go to zoos and have those VIP days. It might be a fortune, but it can give you a real good taster of the type of work people get into. But it's also just go to your local vet and, and, and say, you know, I'd love to, you know, come, come every month on a weekend and just, you know, um, shadow you, just help out um, where I can or just watch if you're doing a procedure, um, that kind of thing. It's, it's just having that insight into the world that you want to um, commit, commit yourself to. I've had people, I, 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 I sometimes wear my logo fleece and I've had people just, um, you know, store counter who's been doing part-time work going, oh, I, I do 3D architecture um, as a hobby and I really want to get into this. Does does your organization get involved in this? And I, you know, I was very quick to hand over my business card and say, look, not directly, but give me your details, send me your CV, I'll see where I could kind of point you. So what you'll find is a lot of people are really open to talk about what they do and possibly put you in touch with people who might be able to uh, uh, push your ambitions forward. You don't need to just tap into your own networks. It could be the random person off the street, though stranger danger as well. So <laughs> uh, with, the, with reason.